this one for our most recent, we couldn't have Sizzle um, in person, but we um, made our 2020 zine and did a um, collaboration for the mini zine. Um, is everyone following me? I can't see myself. It's a little like strange, like I'm talking to myself. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so we're gonna go into it. So what you, so, oh, um, if you Google mini zines, there are tons of different um, instructions and how to make them online, which people have gotten really creative of how to make them, um, but we'll step it through together. Um, okay, did I not put my materials? Ah! We're having problems today. All right, so you're gonna need a copy, piece of copy paper. Eight half by 11 is fine. Well, actually, you should have an eight half by 11. Um, that's the only way I've made them, so. <laughs> um, You can read these instructions, but I'm very sorry that I'm a little <laughs> discombobulated today. <laughs> Are you guys enjoying this? <laughs> um, so let's go by, um, you can read the instructions if you want, but I'm gonna go through um, instructions just by talking with you guys. So I have my piece of paper. I'm going to fold it like a hot dog. I know the first says hamburger, let's do this though. This is much easier. So line up, fold it like this. Yeah. Now you're going to fold it in half again. And one more time. There we go. We just got through those instructions in like two steps instead of <laughs> six. So everyone should have eight equally sized rectangles in their piece of copy paper. And we can only see Jenna. So, good job. <laughs> there you go, yes, yeah, he's got it. Okay. Um, now, it's very important. We want it to end up like this. So what we need to do, I'll show you this example, is cut a slit in the middle. In order to do this very easily, we're gonna unfold the paper, we have the eight rectangle squares. Now fold it into that hamburger and not the hot dog. So we can see four in landscape, four rectangles. We're going to cut from the folded edge on the crease to the first little intersection here. So I'm going to flip it over because it's easier to cut it like this. And then you unfold it. It should look like that envelope from Harry Potter. That <laughs> awesome. Everyone following? Okay. Now we're pretty much done. We're gonna fold it back down hot dog. And then push in the two sides in your looking hot dog so that the um, the slit kind of becomes a diamond and push it until you can fold it in on itself and it becomes a book. Just you'll have to do some creasing with the folds because the um, the folds you made 
We're on the right side yet. And you should have an eight page mini book. Does anyone need help with, oh my gosh, I can see you all now. What is happening? I think I cut mine the wrong way, so I'm trying to start with a new paper. Yeah, no problem. I mean, hopefully you have a bunch of copy paper with you to make <laughs> many versions. Um, so that's the mini zine. It's super easy. We just did it in like less than, I don't know, what was that, five minutes? Um, as you can see, you can unfold it. So just like this one, you can unfold it, put it in a copy machine make a bunch of copies, make hundreds of little books. Um, there, some folks do something on the back as well. So you can unfold it and like give people a poster or um, I know we had one, um, there was one zine at the fest last year that was different delis in St. George and on the back was the map to find them. Um, it was like, so you do all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, any questions? Are you going to send us these instructions so we can have them? Yeah, I can totally send the, um, the slides to Riley and uh, she can send them out to you guys. Great. Because um, I know once I leave this, I'm going to forget everything we did. I'm just going to have this and say, how did that get here? <laughs> I know you can unfold it and you can re reverse it, right? Um, <laughs> Easy gonna... for you to say. <laughs> You're an artist, you can figure these things out. Some of us are technologically challenged. <laughs> I'll definitely send the instructions out, um, but I definitely encourage making a bunch of them. They're lots of fun and you can, I don't know, put anything you want, poetry, um, colors, anything. Um, oh, and here is a picture of what it will, um, what your pages will be when you fold it up. So I recommend, um, doing your drawings or collage or whatever with it unfolded. Um, you just write with pencil, like what the cover front page is. Sometimes I just like fold it up and then write with pencil on what I want to do. And then I unfold it and do the drawings. Um, that way it's just cleaner, easier. Um, you're not drawing on old paper. Um, okay. Ready? No. Okay. <laughs> I was going to copy that on here, so I didn't. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you can fold it back into a book and just write it yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maggie, can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay. I cut too much here, so I got like a semi diamond. It's just oh. one little sliver on the top. Is that right? <coughs> when you fold it like this? When you, you fold it up, it should be. One slit in between the Split. four rectangles in the center of the page. So I, I took out too much. Oh, okay. Try again. It's okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, it gives yeah, me some so right. like when you have it folded, um, hamburger. So when it's portrait and you fold it in half, right? Uh, put a slit around the folded edge to the center. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, so what's the zine? Uh, it's shortened for from magazine. Um, so some people say zine. <laughs> Once I say like magazine, people are usually like, oh yeah. Um, they're self-published, small circulation, often not for profit books, magazines, or, or even websites. So it's very uh, much DIY, do it yourself. Um, and they can be about anything. Um, like just what I was talking about um, earlier with some examples of like rating delis and putting them into a little book, um, poetry, art, um, anything. I have so many of them, but uh, Usually um, themes are you want to say something, put it into onto paper and distribute it. Um, 
it's a great way to to share our our um, thoughts. Some of the some scenes are political or um, you know uh, activists share information and things like that. Um, history zine, Jenna, did you want to talk a bit? Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to add more to uh, the what is a zine. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess uh, the cool part about zines for me is that um, they're so accessible. Um, so I, I'd say that zines were created to confront an elitist uh, journalism industry. Um, it, and it enables uh, people to bypass uh, these commercial gatekeepers and um, average people are then like able to reproduce, um, reproduce, uh, you know, zines very easily um, and um, because of this uh, I, I guess um, the unique part about zines is that uh, they're hyper local um, so it, it really is um, for and by the community um, zines um, so I, I'd say like that's why I was drawn to zines um, because um, I saw kind of a lack of an outlet in Staten Island, um, and I wanted to create one, so um, yeah, I guess that's <laughs> what I had to add. No, that's awesome, yeah, and um, that's a great way to put it, and um, kind of what I did with Sizzle of that, like, hyper-local, and um, getting those artists to, to share and um, collaborate with each other. Um, so, brief history of zines. <laughs> um, since the invention of the photocopy machine, as I'm going to read off my uh, slides here, zine making has been a popular form of independent publishing, especially in underground communities. So um, in 1940, in the 1940s, fanzines, um, where I guess the term was coined in science fiction fandom. Um, so science fiction um, fans were creating these um, little books or magazines to share with each other about um, their their fandom. So uh, just like what people do on used to do on Tumblr and things like that, they're just sharing <laughs> information about characters they like and different things like that. Um, and then... Um, and it, wait, actually, um, yeah. got... Uh, Star Trek not to be discontinued because so many people were outraged. Uh, they they made these fanzines and uh, you're the guys who did it. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Um, so I think of zines also as just like ephemera of like you know sharing pamphlets and um, oh did we Gabby will talk soon too I think um, <laughs> oops did I. Did I mess yeah, that up? Um, but uh, <laughs> and she'll talk about it more of like sharing information and things like that. So I even think of like when the letter brother press was invented, but at that time things weren't accessible. Um, so when photo Xerox machines, photocopy machines um, were invented, people were able to share information much faster and hyperlocal and um, and things like that. Um, so in like the 1990s, it was zines were like the center of the DIY ethic and movements. Like uh, you see the Riot Girl um, zine here. Um, did you have anything um, to add, Jenna? Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, we think of Riot Girl as kind of a genre, but it wasn't just a genre for the people who were participating in it. Um, it was kind of like a feminist movement. It had some flaws, but uh, yeah, it, uh, it pushed back against the, the machismo of the music industry, especially punk music at the time. Um, and zines were an integral part of that movement um, because obviously uh, the mass media isn't gonna be publishing articles about the <laughs> riot girl uh, feminism. So uh, it really enabled uh, marginalized groups to uh, get their message across and um, it influenced uh, 
things like Planned Parenthood and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, zines were integral to uh, creating a community in, uh, in Washington and New York in those areas still. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's an awesome segue to Gabby, actually. So if you want to take it away. It is, and actually, um, I would like to share my screen because I'll show um, our guests some, some um, examples of suffrage publications uh, from our website. So Riley mentioned that Women of the Nation Arise is available uh, in the gallery on weekends and the museum. Um, but if you can't get there, you can experience the exhibit online on the museum's website. Um, and let me just open that up for you. So Women of the Nation Arise takes a hyper-local look at the women's suffrage movement, and uh, it does so by exploring tactics that the local suffragists used, or really suffragists on the grassroots level of the movement used to get their message across since they didn't have formal political power. Um, suffragists were or women were not able to vote. Uh, so they had to convince really men who were the only ones who were able to vote to expand voting rights to include them. Uh, and so the exhibition really looks at how did women claim political power without having political power uh, in the ways that we normally think of it. Um, and so we, we broke it down into five sections for tactics and the last explores um, voting rights, what women did with the right to vote when they got it, which happened in New York in 1917 and nationally in 1920. As we know, this year is the 100th anniversary of the 19th amendment, which um, expanded the electorate to include women, uh, at least formally. Um, and so this, for this, um, workshop today, I'll just focus on the publicized section of the exhibit, which talks about how local suffragists um, got their message out. Uh, and they did so through the local press um, and the national press. So two suffrage journalists um, who we feature in the exhibit are on the left, um, Mary Lawton Met Metcalf, who was uh, involved in the local women's club, and she was a journalist for the Staten Island World, uh, writing for the women folk column in the paper, and Ida B. Wells, uh, who had her own paper that um, fought against slavery. She was an abolitionist and then later uh, anti-lynching ad advocate, sorry, not an abolitionist, an anti-lynching advocate, uh, and also a suffragist, uh, she founded a club in Chicago um, that made headlines nationally because they participated in the 1913 women's suffrage uh, parade in, New in Washington, DC. Um, and they marched in an uh, in a integrated delegation even though organizers wanted the group to be segregated. Um, and she's fascinating. So if you, if you, read more about Ida B. Wells and read some of her examples of her paper online, I'd encourage you to do it. She's fantastic. Um, but like Jenna mentioned, um, suffragist messages were subject to newspaper editors' will, whims, right, about when they wanted their message to appear, where it appeared, uh, and how it was filtered. And so for them, it made a lot of sense to create their own publications um, and so we have three examples of those in our collection, two uh, national papers and one New York State paper. So the suffragist and the woman citizen were both uh, um, publications at the national level and the woman voter was a New York State suffrage party publication. And what's interesting, even from just looking at the covers here on the website is the organizations that published them within the suffrage movement had ideological and tactical differences that you can see just looking at the covers. So the Woman Citizen was published by the National American Women's Suffrage Asso Association um, that was under the auspices of Carrie Chapman Catt, who you may have heard of. 
uh, at the time in the in the 19-teens. And the suffragist was published by the Women's Congressional Union, later the National Women's Party, which was under Alice Paul, who you've probably heard of. Um, and they took different tacks um, in their arguments for women's suffrage. So the woman citizen, even in the name, um, made the argument that women deserved voting rights because they gave as citizens um, in equal ways to men. This is during the First World War. And so this uh, example of the woman citizen on the top row in the middle features a, a mother who lost her son to the war. You see the flag um, in the back. And so it's making an argument that women uh, sacrifice for their country in the same ways that men did and therefore deserve to get the right to vote. On the other hand, um, the suffragists, the Women's Congressional Union, made the argument down at the bottom here where you see um, the spirit of 76, that women actually have had the right to vote since the founding of the United States, that it's an inherent right, an inalienable right, and they don't have to earn or deserve it because they've had it since the beginning. And this made really interesting political conversation in the 19 teens because the women's, um, the National Women's Party um, were the suffragists that were picketing outside the White House. They were arrested um, for disturbing the peace um, and they attracted really negative attention in the press because they were questioning um, President Wilson on a national stage during the war. And so this example on the top right here, um, Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? You see the, the three silent sentinels standing outside the White House. Um, they were often quoting President Wilson's speeches about democracy and why we were, the United States was fighting abroad in Europe to defend democracy when women didn't have access to it at home, uh, which was a radical mes message at the time and a, a different approach from the more traditionally patriotic as it was seen then uh, woman citizen and the National American Women's Suffrage Association. So Dorothy Day from Staten Island, who you, you probably recognize her name, she was, she's now up for sainthood in the Catholic Church. She was the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, um, was a very radical activist in the 19 teens and was arrested and jailed um, with the suffragists at Occoquan Workhouse uh, outside Washington, D.C. And she'll be represented in a memorial there um, opening this year about the, for the women who were imprisoned there. They went on hunger strike for 30 days. If any of you have seen the movie Iron Jawed Angels with Hilary Swank, um, it depicts these events. The third paper, um, the woman voter, is the New York State um, suffrage parties publication. And this was really useful for the exhibit. And I'll just show you one example. This one, this is the image that we used for the postcard of the exhibit. I'm going to call it iconic. We've made it iconic now. You might recognize it from the exhibit postcards. Um, it's about the, the Empire State Campaign, which was um, the, the push for the vote here in New York in 1915. It ultimately failed. We got the vote in 1917. Um, but it began two years earlier. It was like a two or three year campaign. And the Staten Island Party was very involved. And these, um, these publications on our website link to Internet Archive, um, where we have digitized our collection of women's suffrage periodicals. So I encourage you to go and take a look through them. I'm just gonna make this bigger to see in this issue, here's the Staten Island party writing in about tabling at the Dungan Hills Fair. You can see some of the suffragists from Staten Island here and along with Richmond Borough Women's Suffrage Party. 
um, they often wrote in about their activities. And so you learn some of the officers' names and you really hear from women in their own words what they were doing to get the right to vote and why they thought it was important that they had it. So these are really incredible resources for school teachers, for classrooms, for just understanding the movement in the words of the women who are involved in it. Um, yeah, so they're, they're available digitally. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention is this man, Arthur Hollick, who's uh, represented on this page, is one of the museum's founders. Um, and he collected the set of women suffrage periodicals that we have. He and his wife, Adeline Hollick, who we don't have a photo of, um, were both suffragists. They represented Staten Island at the 1913 parade in Washington, DC and at some other meetings. And he made sure to collect almost full runs of all of these periodicals. Um, and so we can thank him for having access that, to them today. And I think that's just a point to make about uh, the importance of these paper documents of movements is that, you know, the zine that you create today can make it into an archive one day and can be the basis of an exhibition on your work and activism 100 years from now. So, you know, write down what's passionate, what you're passionate about, and who knows what life it will have afterwards. So uh, I'll stop sharing here. And then if anyone has questions, let me know. I'll be here for the rest of the workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. That was great. You're so knowledgeable. And it's amazing to hear all that information. Uh, does anyone have questions for Gabby? I don't have a question, but I, um, if anyone's interested in reading about Ida B. Wells, I, I uh, know a book that's really good. It, it compiles some of her writing, so I can put that in the chat um, if anyone's interested. Awesome. Gabby, um, if you can unmute yourself, I, I just have a question about distribution um, of some of that paper ephemera. Can you talk a little bit about like how many people were, were receiving that and, and how they got it out there, how people even signed up to receive it or if it was just handed out at like at a tabling events, that kind of thing, I'd love to know. Sure, um, so there, I believe that there, the New York, the woman voter, the New York State publication had circulation like in the tens of thousands. I'm not sure nationally off the top of my head, um, but they definitely handed them out um, while tabling, but they also had subscriptions. Subscriptions drove publication. So they, um, there are some great photos at the Library of Congress of like women delivering the suffragists on their bicycle and they have like a bag full of them or handing them out on street corners. Um, and uh, Mary Otis Wilcox, who was the chair of the Staten Island party, um, they, they highlighted her in an issue the women voter did because she subscribed all the Carnegie libraries on Staten Island. So I think there were three of them um, to the woman voter and so that people could take them out when they went there and they were like, that's, you know, everybody emulate Mrs. Wilcox. She did such a great thing. And in all the issues, it encourages women to read it and pass it on to a friend. So there's a certain number of subscriptions that we know circulated they they talk about it often in the text and then hand-to-hand -hand, word of mouth sort of thing would have been more circulation that wasn't documented awesome question Rebecca <laughs> um so I'll we'll get into um making our next scene and we can chat about more um, of that later. So, boop, boop. Can you see this? Awesome. So we're going to make a um, another zine, a different type way of making a zine that's um, more book binding. Um, I really like the pamphlet sketch. I think it makes um, your zine. Have a really personal touch and you can 
I mean, make little books and share them. They're one of a kind. I mean, unless you want to make a bunch of, you know, hand sewn books, it's up to you. Um, but I think this is a real, it's a really great way to, to do it. Um, it's also another pretty simple and accessible way to make a book. Um, considering book buying, that if you get really into book buying, and there's some very um, uh, more complex stuff. Um, but this is just using a needle and thread and paper. So uh, you can make your own zine or even like a journal, any, any kind of book. Um, and we can make it now, and of course we can fill it in later. So what I do have the materials list for this one. Um, you're, you must have a needle and thread. I use embroidery thread, um, which is easier to use that because um, it's thicker and it comes in fun colors. Um, so the needle, you want to probably have an embroidery needle in order to get that through. Um, I think this is a good needle. Does everyone have their materials? Um, copy paper, so we'll use four pages. I think that's a good, um, good way to go. I also, if you want, you can have a cover. So you can get a thicker weight paper with car a cardstock or um, something, uh, or even maybe construction paper and make it colorful. Um, you need a pencil and some scissors. Um, you will also, this not on here, but um, get like a thumbtack or a pin. I have I couldn't find my thumbtack, so I got the safety pin. Um, and it's useful to have a ruler or a bone folder. If you don't have a bone folder, a um, butter knife works. This is just for making your folds, your creases really clean, sharp, um, so we don't run into, run into any issues. Um, so, ready? Thumbs up. <laughs> um, this is a very blurry picture of what we're gonna do. So it's very fast. And once you get a hang of it, you can just make them pretty fast. Um, I have instructions on the next slide, but I just wanna show you this because I like visuals. Hope some people might also be visual learners. Um, so you see the number one goes through um, the middle hole. So we're doing a three, I apologize, we're doing a three hole pamphlet stitch. Um, and so the first step, you're going to go through the middle hole, come back through, um, bring it up on to either side, and then loop it over the middle hole and back in. So it's kind of just this like, whoop, feel, um, whoop de doo. <laughs> um, and then we'll tie it off. So this is a lot of words. I mean, I apologize, but I'll, I'll talk. So we're fold. We're going to start by folding our piece of paper into halves. So we're going to do the hamburger style and fold each one individually. So we'll do four folds. And if you want to do your bone folder and make a nice crease. Um, by folding these in half and putting them together, you will be creating a folio, which is our book binding terms. Um, well, one sheet is a folio and then putting them together as a signature, I apologize. Um, This is a very easy. Okay, come on. So I just created a signature. So we'll do four papers, four pages. Um, 
the second uh, yeah, this what we're doing. Doing it with you. I can't see your like hands. It's so upsetting doing things over Zoom. Can't like, you know, it's not as tactful. All right. So I've got my folios into a signature like so. And tap them so they all are joined up like this. We'll go to the next page. Um, you could make your cover now too. I have like a thicker cardstock that I will fold in half and then wrap it outside my folio, my signature here. Um, so as number four says, traditionally in book binding, the hole for when or where you're going to be putting your needle through are pierced before it's sewn. Um, so what we're gonna do is open up our signature book um, and along the trench or the spine, we're going to put three dots with a pencil. You can use a ruler now if you wanna make them equally you know, one in the center and then two on either side of that center, equal parts, um, equal distance away from it. Um, on here, on number five, it does give you. Um, I'm turning, I'm turning. Measurements, but we don't really need to do that. Can I, um, can I just ask the, the three dots, the number five, that's where the three dots should go? Yeah. Um, if you're using different sizes of paper, it's fine to just eyeball it. So you can use a ruler and find the center, put your dot in the center. Okay. So I'm just gonna make a dot. And, and also I, I might be jumping ahead a little bit. Once you make the single folio, right? Cause this is one folio. Can you add folios to the book? Like this is one single folio, right? So, I'm, I apologize. I, I messed the words up. It's a signature when you have all the all the pages together. A folio is one page folded. Um, and then you put the folios together and it becomes a signature. Okay. Um, once you've sewn it, you won't really be able to add more pages unless you just take out the stitching okay. and the paper and then sew it back up, which is no. pretty simple. It's not a glued binding. Right. So you could do that, yeah. Thanks. Um, so we have one hole in the middle and then I'm just gonna eyeball it and put one there and one. If you wanna be precise, you can use your ruler and make, can you see the dot? All right, so once we have our dots, we're gonna make those, um, this instructions don't have it, but I'm gonna do it. Um, in book binding, you could use an awl, as you see here. Um, this awl is too big. The holes um, would be very large. Um, but I'm gonna use my safety pin. And um, I recommend you can use like uh, a dry sponge or something behind it so you don't hurt yourself. Um, poke a hole into your signature through the dots that you wrote or made. And this will make it your life easier putting your needle through the, the dots. Um, also make sure it's straight up and down. Mm -hmm. So now you have three holes to thread your needle through. Okay. Are we ready? We're going to thread our needle. This might take a little while. 
I should have probably threaded it beforehand, but we're doing it together, so. I used a wet sponge instead of a dry sponge. You didn't specify. So I have a wet foley. I have a wet signature. The genius switch is never in the off position. <laughs> I'm quoting David Letterman. A girl after my own heart. <laughs> it's okay. You can sew it and then leave it out to dry. Thank you. I can't leave a lot of stuff out to dry. <laughs> so All right. Um. So this here says you can get your thread should be about three times the length of your booklet. So um, we'll just do that real quick. That looks good. So I have my blue thread. Now, would you all want Hmm. Okay, we're going to go back to here. Is that okay? So we're going to start from the outside. Here's a dumb question. We put a knot at the end of the thread, like when you're sewing? No, don't, no. don't put your, that's a good, good question. Um, you don't have to do that, no. So we're going to go through the back on the folded um, spine through the middle hole. just about like a little tail. Now go through either hole, either side. I'm gonna go to the right, back to the outside. Keep a hand on your um, tail so it doesn't, you're not putting the thread all the way through but you wanna keep it pretty tight. Now that we're on the back on the outside, we're gonna go skip the middle, go through the other hole from the, the back. Again, make sure it's not um, coming undone. Get a little tight. Those should look like this in the back now. Tell me if I'm going fast. And then when you're back on the inside, go back through the middle. So now you're the, the center trench looks like this the back, we have our tail and the, um, your thread attached to your needle. So you can cut it and then make a square knot or any knot really if you want. Um, making sure that you have the, so here, let me show you. We're gonna have the um, this stitch between the two tails, so that when you make your knot, it's all together. Mm -hmm. I forgot I had to tie knot. There you go. 
That's it. Super simple. You could um, put beads on the string. You could cut it a little shorter. You could also start from the inside if you wanted to, and that could be from the inside. I bet you could also make this longer, and it could be like a bookmark if you're making a, a journal or something. Um, does anyone have questions? Did everyone do it? Did I go too fast? Amazing. Yay. It was not too terrible. I, um, I, I have a, you know, phobia about sewing, but it was not that bad. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Three, one stitch or three stitches. Yeah, not bad. Cool. So fast. Um, there's other, there's other versions of the pamphlet stitch. You can do, um, a five hole or seven hole. Um, so you can get really elaborate on the binding and look really cool. Um, but this one's super simple to make a really fast journal. Um, so, so that, so that was our dean. We made two zines today together, um, that you can replicate, especially the mini zine. You can make, you can, um, do an eight page, uh, review of the Zoom and copy it and send it to all your friends. Um, <laughs> and then you can start journaling in your new, um, in your new scene journal. Um, so this last, uh, last slide, actually, we're back up in it. <laughs> um, I did not realize it. Uh, is just, I, so with Sizzle, um, we've done a lot of, um, workshops with um, other students and people like you um, making zines. And this was a little um, steps to assembly with some students that were making a uh, publication. Um, and this is from a, a, a website that I um, will, is in the sources of the slides when I share them. Um, but it's just a little example of like, how you can start making zine. If you're really um, don't know where to start with making a zine, um, if, or if you have an idea that you really want to execute, but you're not sure where to go, um, these are just like really simple steps to think about. Um, so your first one is ideating. So exactly what you want to, um, to make your zine about. Um, you had a really great time today. You wanted to write about it. And um, you know, you're really inspired by Gabby and the Staten Island Museum. Um, so your second step is to gather that information. Maybe you print out some of the um, archive archives. Um, you get your numbers, you have how many people came to the Zoom, you know, whatever information you need. Um, and then you're going to think about collaborators. If, um, if you want, Zines, as we said, it's hyper-local um, DIY community. Um, collaborators are really big. Um, I mean, this is probably where you want to start thinking about, um, you know, who you might need to help you out with um, printing or um, maybe designing a layout for the zine or, you know, someone, you know, has a better eye for things. Jenna's very good at that. Um, and so you want to start uh, figuring out who you need to help you out um, and make a plan with them. And in that plan, you know, number four, you think about that creative direction. Um, so this zine about the Zoom, you know, you want to figure out, you want to you know, what kind of tone you want. Um, this was a really great time. You want to get other people inspired. Um, and what kind of font or drawings are you going to do? Um, maybe each page of your zine looks like a Zoom screen. Um, so that's where you want to um, create that creative direction and make sure you all are on the same um, page about what that what that is. Um, things with our... Um, the sizzle zine, uh, it's a very um, nebulous compilation, but the the um, the kind of creative direction is it's it's Staten Island, it's hyper local um, with some other collaborators. So um, 
even in our zine, we had archive photos of Staten Island. Um, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we had lots of folks that sent in like photos from the ferry, um, you know, different really cool Staten Island things. And then we also had some international people that sent in stuff. So like it, it was hyper local, but then, you know, if someone in Staten Island is looking at it, they're also getting a little piece of, um, I think there was someone from the UK that sent something in. So, uh, so you want that created like what, what you want your zine to, to um, make, how they you want make people to feel or something. Um, so, and then you'll design, um, then you'll um, assemble and print. So if you're going, oh, um, if you're going to sew every single zine, you know, you, you wanna do that, um, you wanna make that plan. Um, printing, maybe you're just gonna go um, into the office, sneak in and uh, photocopy 100 zines. Uh, you do it. Um, and then looking. sharing. What's that? No one's looking right now. They're all on Zoom, so. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I moved and I was like, I don't have any paper. I realized that I was using copy paper from wherever I was for a very long time. <laughs> uh, libraries should be open nowadays. Um, and then you'll start sharing and distributing. So um, the really cool thing I do want to note with the um, mini zine is that you can unfold it, copy it, and make a digital version of it, share it, and everyone on the internet can print it out and make a zine out of it. Um, there are uh, zine, so people that distribute zines are called zine, zine distros. Um, there are all sorts of um, people that have like Google folders of tons of zines that they share um, publicly. Um, and in this step, just what I talked about with that the distro, if you are someone that um, you want your zine to get out further than your local community, um, you can reach out to distros, um, ask them to print your zine and share them. Um, you can go to zine fests um, often, you know, distros go to Zine Fest so that you yourself, the creator, don't don't does not have to go. Um, and yeah, just put pop them into everyone's mailbox, and they all know what a great time you had at the Zoom. And <laughs> um, does anyone have questions? Or Jenna, did you have any more to say? Um, this is you know you've made a lot of zines as well about this process. Oh, um, yeah, well, I, I'd say a big thing that I hear a lot is, oh, I don't want to make a zine. No one would want to read it. Um, and to that, I say, just do it anyway. And if you're scared, um, the collaborators uh, option is very important. I'd say just do it with your friends. Um, it's better to do it than, than not to because in the state that we're living in, the very divisive state that we're living in right now, um, we need to hear different voices. And um, mm -hmm. there are a few very loud voices right now on Staten Island that uh, kind of make me ashamed of this place. Um, and if anyone else has anything to add, they really should and they really should not be afraid. Um, and if you need any printing advice, please uh, contact me directly. <laughs> oh yeah, I can also share the Sizzle Gmail too in case you, yeah, anyone has questions. But um, so does anyone wanna share um, or ask questions or um, if you had ideas what you're gonna make your zine out of when we um, leave each other? This show just me. Hi, I, I, I'm... Uh... I'm turning so we don't see anybody else who's might might or may not, may or may not be sitting next to me. Um, one of the the uh, things I was thinking about, um, and it really ties in with the, with the suffragettes. Um, I found this pile of Women's World magazine, and I've just been cutting out like bye bye stretch marks, drop two pounds every day, 
until the foam roller activates your inner Spanx, discover a slimmer you, you know, all of the things, you know, the way that, you know, that's marketed to women. And even though women now have the right to vote, they still, um, in a lot of ways, are certainly not seen to be equal to men. So I, I you know, I thought it would be a, a very ironic statement. And then also, I have, I just have to shout out to Sue and Linda, they're here from Oh, Island, far away. They're in my Zoom writing group, the wonder of Zoom. And I was thinking this format uh, would be so great for flash fiction or flash nonfiction, you know, short pieces, you know, that would fit on a single page. And it would be a you know, great venue for that. So that's my two cents. That's a great idea. Or even that like exhibit, exquisite corpse. Um, what is that? Um, yeah. You know, and now we can't gather together. You could write a page of something, send it to your friend, and they can yeah. write on their page, and you can, you know, circulate it around your friends. That's a really cool idea. I was just, because uh, I'm in this writing, because we're writing together, and I was just taking an online class about writing, and the professor was talking about making a commonplace book. I never, I mean, I know what a commonplace book is, but I never like thought of it in terms of modern day. I've read about it in, you know, historical fiction. And, and so it's a wonderful way to make a commonplace book that if you have, if you come across snippets of poetry or, or segments of a book or things that inspire you or, or prompts, this is a great um, something to have so you can keep a com make a commonplace book. This is, I guess, what they would be called back in the 18th century or the 17th century. So that's another way to do it. Is is you know, it's a creative way to do that. And to your point, Sue. I've also seen them. We have a few in the archive where they would hand them to each other for like there would be more than one set of writing in them, like to. Uh, you know, your friend would write you a quote that inspires them or that, you know, so it was, it was very communal too. Yeah. I mean, when I was in school, I, this is going to date me, but uh, there was something called, a, um, I think it was a gag book or a fag book, something like that. And it was at the end of sixth grade, everybody had a page and everybody right. wrote in your gag. I, I can't remember the, the, the term for it. I think um, I think it was a slap something wasn't it like slam a, slap a slam book a slam book a, a slam. The came by, you had to slam it shut <laughs> yeah oh okay that maybe it was a slam book slam and book, yeah. um you know your favorite person and I don't know who, the best color and your favorite song I mean that's the kind of thing this is in in essence a slam book I should have kept mine because like in 10 years they're going to be worth something that's right <laughs> um, my my granddaughter, who may or may not be sitting next to me, um, made. She's working on a second book right now. Foods this that she great. likes. This is a big book of family, and she this has uh, several family members on every That's page. Great. She's really loving this format. That's great. great. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Just wanted to say um, that I also remember slam books, so I just want to put that out there. Um, in my generation, they were kind of nasty. Like, um, like that, you know, it could be, it could be. That's why I threw them away. <laughs> it depended if you were a popular kid or not. I mean, it was, and it was yeah, and it, and it was, was stuff you did not want the teacher to see. If, yeah, if you found it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I wanted to comment on um, how much I learned in today's workshop in terms of the potential of this medium um, to communicate and to even, you know, create change um, and just to communicate, um, you know, on, on, on so many, basically anything. Like I even was thinking about how, um, about like holiday cards and how those are yeah. sent out and like, and how that first, that mini zine, and how it's downloadable. I don't know, my mind's just been racing. There's just so many different avenues that I think you can take this medium um, and, and we see the importance of it and the, the, um, the power in just grabbing that, you know, and making it your own. Um, and it was just a really inspiring workshop. So I want to, thank I want you. to thank Maggie and Jenna and Gabby and everyone who came um, and, 
I'm gonna hand it over to Maggie, Jenna, and Gabby if you have any last words. I just wanted to thank everyone. Um, this has been a really great workshop. Thank you, it was great. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Except for my wet sponge, I really did okay. <laughs> I was so sorry. It, it sounds like a great exhibit. Of... <laughs> yeah, it does sound like thank a great you. exhibit. Yeah, let's have a field trip. Yeah, when we get out of this, when we get out of this, we should yeah. ask. <laughs> And just for what you said, Riley, um, it, I've been doing this for about two years and I love teaching people how to make those mini scenes. Just from Jody, what your granddaughter is making two of yeah. them already. I have had so many parents come talk to me um, after workshops and say like their children went home and made like 10 more books afterwards. Oh, yeah. It's such a, yeah. um, from a piece of paper that is usually sitting in a printer and you take yeah. it and you can make it into a yeah. book. Um, and, yeah. I, I taught science for 25 years and I used to use this a lot. Like uh, if I was teaching the periodic table, they, uh, each kid would have an element and they would make a book about the element and they have, you know, there was a, a, a rubric like what they had to put on each page. And cool. it, it's a great tool for teachers because it's fun for the kids and it's really easy to grade. <laughs> uh, we, we use it for a lot of, lot of different topics and the kids always love them. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you all for joining us. I don't Thank know you. If, Thank if you. you have to leave or we can. Thank you for sharing, Jody. Thanks, Jody. <laughs> Thanks, Bye, Linda. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.